As many of you know, we regularly have a Sabbath school class here at this time on Sabbath morning. And this morning, we're very happy to welcome many of you who don't regularly come here for a very, very special guest. And I'm going to ask Dr. Brandstetter to introduce him and leave all the time to him. Good morning. Your, your energetic conversation suggests to me you're wide awake and waiting to hear what our visitor has to say. Welcome anyway. I'm Bernard Brandstetter, but some of you may know. And uh, I feel privileged this morning to introduce our guest. You've got to be careful what you pray for because it just might come your way. And I've prayed that we would have someday a visit from Dr. John Sanford. So here we are this morning. He's here with us. Let me just make sure you know why we are privileged. John Sanford has been a long-time professor at Cornell University. Uh, not in the field of medicine, as so many of us here in Loma Linda are, but in the, in the field of agricultural science and crop engineering. And in that field, he has been remarkably successful. To him probably goes most of the credit for what is widely known as the gene gun, which is not an instrument of warfare. It's an instrument of improving crops and making them more productive. And it has improved the welfare of people around the world. But in other respects, John Sanford has made some unique contributions to the science of population genetics. What happens to a population as a result of changes in the DNA? He will, he will tell you about that. All I'm going to tell you is, is implied in his title here, Down, Not Up. The evolutionary theory tells us that the human race is improving. John Sanford has to tell you that is not the case. We are degenerating, and at, a, and at a, a very disturbing rate. In fact, he repeated to me this morning, when I asked him, how fast are we degenerating, John? He said, don't make any plans after 2096. <laughs> As a result of his own research, John Sanford has, has come to persuasing conclusions, persuasive conclusions, that indeed uh, our genome is deteriorating. He has put all of these conclusions into a, a splendid book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. It's easily available on Amazon. I recommend it to you. And the other thing I must say is that we owe him a debt of gratitude, and I want to do something that we don't often do, but this morning I'm going to pass around the hat and invite you to make a contribution to uh, help pay for the expenses of not only Dr. Sanford, but his delightful wife. Helen, there you are. Raise your hand. Thank you. That's Helen Sanford. They are our house guests in Redlands. It's been a, a great pleasure to have them with us. And uh, I'd like you to have a chance this morning to say thank you. So when it reaches you, it's up to you to decide how you'd like to express your, your appreciation. Thank you. So this is Dr. John Sanford. Welcome to Loma Linda. John, these are your friends. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, OK, let's see. Let's make sure I switched it on. It's on. So maybe I just have to speak up. Um, but if we crank up the volume, that will, be, that will help too. Um, so as I, as I'm really soft-spoken. And so uh, as soon as I forget to be loud, I get soft. And then, so if some of the people in the back could do this, maybe I'll see you, and that'll help me to bring up the volume some more. Um, I'd just like to uh, say that I'm honored to be here with you and that you would give me your, this uh, slot in your Sunday School program. 
And I would just like to say that uh, the week I've spent here at uh, Loma Linda University has been a huge encouragement for me. I'm just so excited with this place and the things that are happening here where people can be committed to Christ and his word and his mission and yet still be doing top-level research and, and medical training. And so this is, uh, this is a huge inspiration for me. I'm just greatly encouraged. And I'd, um, you know, it's such a wonderful thing that we can come together on Sabbath to worship and to encourage one another and to educate and edify one another and to exhort one another. And so I pray that I might be able to be an encouragement to you today. Um, the thing I'm going to be talking about is the something, basically the fundamental reality of the fall. So it's not a happy thing, but what's w the good news is that there's redemption. So, uh, but I, the, the fall is real and it's, it's visible in our genome. And so uh, before I start, I'd just like to start with prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day, this fellowship, and I ask you, Lord, that you would illuminate our minds so that we can more clearly understand uh, your truth and your plans for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So what do you do with a title called Down Not Up? I, I, I owe that title to my brother, who is uh, who's, um, not a scientist, but read my book and understood it, and I said... Um, uh, you know, I said, my, my thesis gets kind of complex, and I wish I could just boil it down to something really simple. And he said, I can tell you what your book is about. It's down, not up. And I said, thank you, <laughs> Brother Steve. <laughs> and uh, so I'm done. <laughs> That's really uh, the message. Uh, there are two worldviews out there, basically. Uh, one is that we are naturally going up, left to itself. Life not only gets better and better, but it can innovate whole new uh, things like brains and wings. and um, The other point of view is that we're naturally going down, which is the, the biblical point of view. So let's just consider the biblical point of view. Uh, I'm sure it's clear to you all, but, um, but let's just look at it ag again a little more carefully. Uh, scripture says that since the fall, everything is wearing out. In Hebrews 1, it says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. Isn't that mysterious uh, and, and uh, wonderful? Uh, in terms of ourselves, Psalm 39 says, Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. And that psalm continues to say, When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is vapor. So scripture is consistently telling us we are fleeting like a vapor. We are flowers quickly fading. We are dying because of entropy. And so in 1 Peter, uh, again, it comes back to this theme, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So um, this theme of the degeneration since the fall can be seen if we look at the longevity of the patriarchs, starting with uh, the descendants of Noah. And so these are, um, you know, you don't usually think of the Bible as a place where you can get scientific data, but actually in Genesis, uh, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of ages and dates. And so um, when I was a, a, a new believer, I read these things and I thought, they somebody just made up these numbers. <laughs> these are crazy numbers. Uh, but then uh, I, I saw that people were plotting the data, and so just I didn't quite believe it, so I plotted the data for myself. I took the dates out of Genesis and, I, and, uh, and actually other later books in the Bible, and I just put them, uh, plotted them out as a graph to see what it looks like. And so this is the plot. 
It, uh, on the, life, uh, the, the left hand, you have this, the scale of lifespan with Shem living to be about 600 years old and then uh, the, his descendants. And then you see the, uh, uh, on the bottom scale are the number of centuries after, born after Noah, who lived to be 950 years old. And what you see is what any biologist would immediately recognize as a biological decay curve. And uh, so it doesn't look like uh, the author of Genesis just pulled out a bunch of random numbers here. And in fact, uh, the, the last few, the, the middle two dots are, um, are Moses and Joshua. And so, and the last dot, just to bring things to completion, is the, is the, the lifespan of Jesus. And so we're talking about the lifespan from Shem to Jesus here. Those are all the dates I could find in, that, the, in the Bible. That, and it's, there, it's a pattern. Do you notice there's a pattern here? Uh, now, I suppose you could say, well, the authors of the Bible got together and conspired and said, let's try to portray a, uh, a, a biological decay curve. But I don't think that's very likely. So this, is, this particular graph is one of the strongest, uh, for, as a scientist, one of the strongest evidences for me that Scripture is telling us, not speaking figuratively, not speaking uh, creatively, but telling us history. And it speaks of a decline. So let's just jump now to part two. Uh, I'm going to have, I think there are five or six parts here. Just change, change channels for a second. Now we're going to look at the scientific view of degeneration. Um, you know, entropy and the second law of thermodynamics are natural laws. These are fundamental truths that all scientists understand to be true. I'm told that Einstein considered the second law of thermodynamics the most important natural law because it, it, it overrides all other laws. And so um, people argue about exactly how to define entropy and the second law. And you know, uh, physicists would define it a certain way and reduce it to a formula. But I'm using these more in the, in the common language. If you Google entropy, what you'll come up with is degeneration, decay. And so, uh, so let's just call all of this just the law of degeneration. And let's just see if it's, if it's applicable. Degeneration, we know, applies to energy systems. Uh, the second law basically says energy always dissipates. You start out with useful energy, and it dissipates into uh, diffuse heat. And so we know that energy always degenerates physical order. Think about your home or your apartment, and um, what would happen if, you st if, if people stopped taking care of it? and how quickly it, it comes unglued. Um, the, the, the process of entropy in terms of our own possessions and our own home and our own car is just so abundantly clear. And, uh, and you know, this process of degeneration applies to information. Have you ever seen how information degrades as it passes from one person to another? And pretty soon the information is seriously messed up. How many of you think that 100 years from now, the information in your computer will still be preserved? <laughs> so what we see is information is systematically degrading. Even, even the information in our brains has to be relearned repeatedly. And so biological information is also subject to degeneration, which is really a large part of what we're going to be talking about today, is the biological information that makes life life is coming undone. And so we're going to be looking at the fact that living organisms and populations of organisms, whole species, are subject to this same process. And so from a strictly scientific basis, it would seem obvious that this should apply, that this is applicable across the board, degeneration. So entropy, we, if we look at this concept of entropy, it means that everything's degrading apart from one thing, intelligent intervention. I, I'd really like you to grasp that because uh, in our own life, we do. We're, if we work really hard, things stop coming undone and we can hold things together. And sometimes we can even improve our house or improve our, uh, some other aspect of our life. And technology can improve uh, information systems. But it always takes two, two things, an intelligent will. An intelligent will is the counterforce to entropy. 
That's the only reason why our lives aren't utterly um, in ruins. And so we work at it, but we can hold back the force of entropy. And so I would just like you to consider, people often ask me, what, what, is it, what do you think as a geneticist, what would have stopped mutation in the Garden of Eden? And uh, I believe it is an intelligent will. The will of God can sustain all things. God is sustaining the whole universe right now. But in, before the fall, God could, could sustain everything, including the genome. And, and, and people ask me, well, how can, how can you believe in a literal heaven where we will have imperishable bodies, incorruptible bodies? Well, God's will will have been fully restored. And where God's will is fully in force, there, his, he can sustain every atom in our body. body. And we don't have to worry about things coming unglued because every time a little something comes apart, he's the ultimate maintenance man. He can go in and fix it. That's my personal take on, on, on entropy before the fall and after his return. So uh, let's now look at the genetic view of degeneration. So here's some good news. Mutations are killing us. <laughs> uh, and it, 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 it would be... I'd say it in a more, much more sober way, except we all know it. It's not, I'm not telling you something new. Mutations are just typographical errors, word processing errors in our DNA code, which contains the specifications for life. And so they're molecular mistakes. It is, mutations are literally a product of physical entropy in the way that a physicist or chemist would speak of it. it it's because of atomic mistakes, uh, which result in molecular mistakes, which result in defective genes. And so entropy is uh, expressed at the genetic level, and uh, we experience it in a very personal way. Uh, as we've studied the mutation process, we've been more and more shocked to learn at how high the mutation rate is. The mutation rate in our bodies is approximately three new mutations every time a cell divides in your body. So when you, were, when you existed as a zygote, there would have been uh, three new mutations. And when that zygote divided into two cells, both of those cells would have about six mutations. And when they divided, every cell would have nine mutations. And um, so that's kind of a scary thought. So uh, Michael Lynch, a, a very well-respected population geneticist, uh, was elected into the National Academy of Science just a few years ago, and his inaugural paper was on human mutation. And he concludes uh, with some really startling things. He said, by the time you're 15 years old, you have an average of 6,000 mutations per cell. And so no two cells in your body at by that time are identical. In fact, they're, they're, every cell in your body is different because of mutation. By the time you're my age, uh, in, in a, a, a tissue such as the skin, which keeps dividing rapidly, uh, I have about 40,000 new mutations that weren't there when I was born. So, so no wonder I'm feeling tired, right? <laughs> Actually, literally, there are mutations in our mitochondria, which is where our energy is produced. So, um, so you probably get the idea that... Um, Mutations are the primary cause of aging and death, and that is what Michael Lynch concludes. And so he concludes by saying, there is little potential for substantially increasing the upper limit of human lifespan. It's about 120 years. It's been about 120 years since after the flood. And God said, I will limit your life. I will, I I will limit. You have a, will have 120 years. And so, um, so this is very personal, isn't it? It's very personal, something we can relate to. Um, so the mutational degeneration of our genes, which is clearly seen by this, what's happening in our own body. I have uh, and, uh, given uh, the, the, the title of genetic entropy, and I think it's very, very appropriate and very, very important principle. So this is kind of what genetic entropy looks like. Um, this is uh, a human being, a picture of a human being, where all the A's, T's, C's, and G's of the DNA 
on the, uh, on the left are in the right places. So the specifications are in order, and that's why we have an orderly body. And mutations basically randomize our specifications, and so you can see, uh, you know, in the morning I feel like the guy on the left, and in the afternoon I feel like the guy on the right. And so that's a very nice picture of this uh, genetic entropy process, the dissipation of information. And um, this type of, this, this process, this type, the an entropy on this level is undisputed. Everybody, un uh, you know, biologists understand this is definitely happening to the individual. So the whole world is groaning, your dog and the whales and everything is dying because of this process. So part four. Uh, let's look at it now, not from a personal point of view, but from a population point of view. Because uh, evolution happens in terms of populations, not people. And, uh, and the, in the big picture, populations can also go extinct. So again, life itself is wearing out like a garment, not just for the individual, but for all life, because entropy doesn't just cause the decay of the individual. The mutations that we have are transmitted to our children. And that is a big problem. So not only do I have the 40,000 mutations that I've accumulated on my own account, but I inherited thousands and thousands of mutations from my ancestors. And that's what I, we're talking about now. So uh, let's just think about human genetic entropy. Uh, we don't know the exact mutation rate in man, but it's in the range of 60 to 175 new mutations per person, per generation. Now that's, uh, let's just call it 100 be for, for simplicity. 100 new mutations per person per generation. Now that's lower than the 40,000, isn't it? I mean, I, fortunately, the re our reproductive cells are sequestered by design so that they have less cell division. They're kind of set aside early during uh, embryogenesis so that there's minimal cell division and minimal mutation. So uh, even though um, I have... Let's, let's talk about the younger people. Even though younger people have thousands of mutations in their body per cell, within their reproductive cells, it's only 100 or so. Praise God for good design. But, um, but that's still a huge problem because um, it means that we all carry tens of thousands of bad mutations. And, uh, and there's no question about that. That's uncontested. And uh, we, s we see that 2 to 3% of babies have visible birth defects. That's, you know, the tragic consequences of the fall. And, uh, and so we've cataloged thousands of genetic diseases in man. And so this is all s part of the tragedy of the fall. And so this, this, this growing genetic load, wh what's called genetic load, uh, is really, really tragic. Just consider for a second how many uh, beneficial new mutations you've heard about spreading through the population. If you've heard, if you're heard, you know, some great new mutation coming out of Asia, maybe. Have you heard about that? I, I, don't, I haven't heard about it either. The closest thing, uh, best example, supposed example of beneficial mutation in man is sickle cell anemia. Because uh, even though sickle cell anemia is a semi-lethal condition, uh, you're less like you, you have re some resistance to malaria. But that's a broken, there's no question that sickle cell anemia is a broken gene. Unequivocally, it's a broken gene. It, it's so broken that even the malarial parasite doesn't like it. <laughs> so um, so that's, uh, that's the best, the best uh, the classic example of a beneficial mutation in the human population. So the thing is, to my amazement, as I looked into this, is, is that the leading population geneticists totally agree that the human race is degenerating. Uh, Dr. Crow is probably the most uh, significant geneticist of the 20th century. He just passed away at 96. And um, in his, one of his last papers, he wrote, there unquestionably, we're in genetically inferior to cavemen. And Dr. Kondrashoff, a, a high-level population geneticist, well-respected, said no human geneticist doubt man, doubts that man is degenerating. And Dr. Lynch, again, the one that I mentioned earlier in his recent paper, said even assuming a lower mutation rate, we are degenerating at 1 to 5% per generation. <coughs> so how long can that last? How much time 
has passed. Again, uh, Michael Lynch's paper, he says, in the next few centuries, significant we will see in significant incapacitation at the morphological, physiological, and neurobiological levels. What can we say to that? I guess I say, come soon, Jesus. Amen. So Michael Lynch ends his paper by saying, um, the problem is we just don't have enough death and suffering. We don't have enough natural selection operating. And, uh, and he makes an extraordinary proposition at the end of his paper. We'll just have to go to the third world where there is more death and suffering, where there's supposedly less genetic damage happening, and, uh, and that'll be our hope for the future. That's really strange because you'll find that the third world is also full of the same degenerative processes as we're experiencing. So genetic entropy in the past um, is a question, you know. They would, the evolutionists would say, well, this has been going on for a long time, but in the ancient times, natural selection was stronger, there was more ruthless survival of the fist fittest, and, and, and the degenerative process could be stopped. That's one of the things what I've been looking at. And um, it's really interesting because not only do most cultures have uh, traditions, uh, you flood, flood legends and creation legends, uh, most of them have legends of men of yore. You know, where, there were, where people in the old days were vastly superior in terms of longevity and abilities. Uh, even the Greek gods looked like they're practicing uh, a type of ancestor worship more than uh, actually worshiping supernatural beings. And so I just return to this figure. Uh, scripture clearly speaks of people in the past who were vastly superior to ourselves. Uh, the first 10 generations, uh, the, the lifespan was between, it was approximately 950 years per person. Uh, that's now we're down to around 70, and that's with lots of medical intervention. So genetic entropy, this process is everywhere we look. It is painfully obvious. It is the bad news. It's perfectly in keeping with scripture. It reveals a desperate need we have for a savior because we are dying. And it's the good news. The, it, it prepares us for the good news. If you don't understand the bad news, you will not be able to receive the good news. If you think that we're evolving and everything's fine and we got it under control and maybe with a few more medical breakthroughs we're going to solve the problem of death, um, you don't need Jesus. Okay, Power, Darwin's powerful delusion, despite the overwhelming evidence that we are degenerating and that, and, that that, and that the rate of degeneration is too high for natural selection to be able to um, sustain things, uh, Darwin's powerful delusion remains uh, totally in control of academic, the academic world. The neo-Darwinian theory, which is the basically the updated version of Darwin's theory, is that natural selection is the one th and only thing that can reverse entropy. And that uh, since sometimes, on rare occasion, a beneficial mutation happens, and since we know selection does happen, therefore, uh, obviously, bad mutations will be selected away, good mutations will be amplified, and we'll just keep getting better and better forever. So Darwin's, this, this thought, that simple idea, which I call the primary axiom, is the most empower empowerful intellectual paradigm ever, in my opinion. It reigns supreme in all of academia. It virtually governs our culture. Um, I would argue that this is the powerful delusion that Second Thessalonians speaks of. And um, I'd just like to ask you, what if this theory could be falsified? Would that matter? You know, most of the young people who leave the church, if you ask them, why are you leaving? It's because they've been persuaded that evolution makes God uh, a fairy tale. And uh, if you go evangelize in Europe, the typical answer when you say, do you believe in Jesus, is the answer is, no, I believe in Darwin. And for myself, when I was in high school, uh, I, my, my science classes completely convinced me, and I, and I, I became an atheist in high school. So this is a big deal. And so wouldn't it be a big deal if we could falsify Darwin's theory? 
Well, it turns out that uh, Darwin's theory is coming down. And there was a really exciting symposium at Cornell, organized by, by myself and some uh, associates, uh, and it was entitled Biological Information, New Perspectives. And uh, basically, it was um, uh, over a 120 people gathered, about half of them PhDs, 25 speakers who were uh, PhD scientists, uh, talked about the, f the reality of, number one, the biological information in living systems is astounding, wonderful, fearfully and wonderfully made. And number two, it is coming undone. And um, this conference had people from every field, from physicists, biophysicists, chem biochemists, chemists, mathematicians, uh, geneticists, molecular biologists, um, computer scientists, all these people came together and we were agreed on one thing, and that is that Darwin was wrong. So um, you've, you've heard the story about uh, a dark room and there's, or, or several blind men who, are, who discover an elephant and one of them touches the, the trunk and says an elephant is like a, a hose and another one touches uh, the, a leg and says an elephant is like a tree and all that. Well, I, this is a little bit in reverse. What's happening is um, molecular biology are look is uh, biologists are looking at the backbone of Darwinian's theory, Darwin theory, and um, and they're saying Darwin was wrong. And then the information theorists are looking at it, and they're saying Darwin was wrong. And population geneticists are looking at Darwinian theory, and they're going Darwinian theory doesn't work. It goes down, not up. And then the thermodynamic scientists are looking at the same thing, and they're saying, this, uh, this doesn't fly. And so diverse fields of science, when people use their critical uh, thinking skills and, and appropriately challenge uh, dogma, uh, all agree that the Darwinian mechanism doesn't work. And so that is exciting. And so uh, you, I... Um, I this, this was a book that took me uh, like five years to put together, basically re-examining my own Darwinian commitments and presuppositions. Things, I had believed the Darwinian mechanism for decades as a scientist because I never critically examined it. It must be true because all the authorities around me said it was true. And I examined it very, very carefully. And I found, it, logically, it doesn't work. And I also found that all the literature in the field of population genetics s basically showed that m the leading population geneticists realized it didn't work either, although they, it was their trade secret. They didn't advertise that. But th a lot of people have told me this, is the, this book is the most powerful argument against uh, Darwin's theory. And, and I, I do think it's a very powerful argument. I have not found any neo-Darwinian advocate who can defend neo-Darwinism in the, f in the face of these arguments. That's exciting. Um, I actually think there is one more, more uh, str even stronger evidence, um, and that is uh, research that myself and uh, four other scientists have been doing for the last seven years. Um, it's called numerical simulation, and it's uh, basically combining computer science and genetics, and what we can do is actually uh, realistically simulate the mutation selection process. And um, the, the selection, mutation selection process is a mechanical process. You can actually, it's very much subject to what's called computer simulation. Mutations enter, let's consider ourselves a population. Um, everybody in the population gets 100 new mutations. Some of the mutations are good, some of them are bad, mostly are bad. Most of some are, have, are very deleterious. M most are very slightly deleterious. And, um, and then what you do is define who's most fit based upon their mutations. And let's suppose these folks over here are less fit. Well, we just select them away. You can, you're not allowed to have children. And let's suppose this group over here, you have uh, less de deleterious mutations. So we're going to let them have extra children and the rest of you just uh, do your own thing. So. Um, so that's, that's, that is the process. Mutations come in at the atomic level, and they're re removed by taking away some people and letting other people amplify. 
You see how that works? It's very me mechanistic, and so you can then, when they have children, we can track the transmission of their genes to the children, uh, and, and we can then bring in new mutations and then do more cycling. Uh, and so you can actually simulate the process in a very biologically realistic way. And I'm not going to go into depth. I, have, I gave uh, three technical talks on campus, and this isn't a technical talk. I just want to say that uh, numerical simulation is really the, the, the final straw. It really nails it, the Darwinian mechanism. We can show in a most conclusive way that the Darwinian mechanism doesn't work as advertised. Yes, selection happens. Yes, you can have adaptation. But the net effect of all the mutations, even after selection, is down, not up. So Mendel's accountant, it's a computer program. Uh, I've already said that. So um, I just wanted to show you an exper quickly show you a results of a single experiment. This is fitness over time. And so uh, fitness starts out with a fitness of one. There's no mutations, neither good nor bad. We introduce good and bad mutations into the population. We select away the inferior individuals, and then we let them, the remaining population intermate, and then uh, we bring in more mutations and more cycles of selection. So on the bottom, we see how many generations. This runs 200 generations. Why do you think we would choose 200 generations for this simulation? Yeah, how many generations from us to Adam? About two, uh, less than 200. Not much time. Uh, the red line shows the decline in, in uh, fitness over time. And uh, you see a catastrophic decline in fitness. We're, we're modeling 100 mutations, which is the actual mutation rate. Normally, we would model 10 mutations because we're conceding, oh, okay, maybe 90% of the genome is junk DNA, but actually... Another story is junk DNA is dead. Basically, in 2007, it was shown that uh, the genome is fully functional. Okay, we're almost done. Um, does, that, does this decline curve look familiar to you? So it looks way familiar. So using the most realist, biologically realistic parameters in our numerical simulations, uh, we get uh, output that looks exactly like the biblical data. And that's just uh, astounding to me. Um, yes, sir? This sounds like chicken little syndrome. Greek and Hindu superminds deciphered and indulged in these supernatural issues. Love, respect your parents, you live forever. Longevity, assured. The quasi-scientists, politicians, and some clergy are are responsible for extirpation of life. Not commentators, but God has the answer, he is the answer. For millennia, or the inception of time, there have been mystics, scientists, think tanks, theologians, demagogues, pessimists and optimists, and so on. People were dwelling on these things. Can you, can you ask a question? I, I thought you had a question. Uh, no, I'll finish in half a minute. Your assumptions and extrapolations, confabulations have some credence. You expounded very intelligently, but these are incomplete. Your arguments are based on the Old Testament and in the lab. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the feedback. I'm almost done now because uh, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I'd just like to uh, summarize the conclusions. Um, there are many lines of evidence that show that the Darwinian me mechanism doesn't work as advertised. Selection happens. Sometimes you can get a beneficial mutation that allows adaptation. But, you, but what's happening is for every beneficial that gets selected, there's 100 or more deleterious mutations that are entering. So the net effect, you know, when, if, you're, if you have a running a business, you can say, well, we're, we're making money. That's not the question. The question is, are, are, you, are you making more money than you're spending? What's the net effect? And so all the analyses that I've seen and done indicate that, um, it's, that this mechanism that's so profoundly affected in the academic community is not correct. 
So genetic entropy is real. It's supported by the laws of nature. It's obvious at our personal level. It's compel there's compelling logic if you look at just population genetic theory. And then honest numerical simulations, in my opinion, really nails it. It's a, it's a done deal. And so down, not up, what does it mean? It means that evolution is going the wrong way. It means Darwin was wrong. It means life is running down. It means life, therefore, cannot be very old. If we're degenerating at 5% per year, guess what? It doesn't, it doesn't let you extrapolate very far backwards. And, and if you do extrapolate backwards and say, given our rate of decline, where were we before? What we conclude is there had to be a beginning, a creation, when man was perfect. And so, um, uh, remar I did not dream when I started to do this. When I started to do this research 10 years ago, I thought, maybe I can put a little ding in the armor of Darwin. And instead, what I see is Darwin and Darwinian theory is a house of cards that is coming down. And what I saw, it, by God's grace, is an incredible affirmation of Scripture. Amen. So, I'd just like to close by saying, um, let us exhort one another to more fully trust Jesus and his word. Even when we don't quite understand it all, even when it seems like uh, there are a lot of still unanswered questions, let's just be believers and be faithful to him. So praise God. Amen. Amen. We, we have a few minutes for questions, if I assume mic coming. No. If I you have a question, please wait for the mic. Go ahead. Taking this into consideration, say if you excluded God, what would be the fate of mankind and all the animals? So it's hard to exclude God because where did the animals? And I know, but I mean, <laughs> theoretically, if you But could. if you could take God out of, the f out of the picture, I think everything will go extinct. And so it's yeah, the right. extinction process is the logical consequence. We do simulations. We do the same simulation we did here, let it run for 200 more years and uh, 200 more generations. And yeah, it goes extinct. And so uh, that's and, uh, one of the talks I, sp I gave, uh, I think it was Thursday, talked about uh, viruses, and there's good evidence that even things like viruses are subject to this decay process. Okay, uh, I'd like to say that we studied your book in uh, Dr. Paul Gimp's Sabbath School, and it was very interesting, all the comments and everything. I enjoy reading your book. I would recommend everybody to read it to buy it and read it. Now, I have a question for you. Do you, by any chance, have a message for those Adventists who are wavering between evolution and creation? Um, I have a message for them as um, a message of um, understanding, because I was, for 10 years, a theistic evolutionist. And uh, the data by itself can be ambiguous. Actually, the data on this particular issue is, doesn't seem ambiguous to me anymore. It's very clear that you can't have spontaneous life and that the Darwinian mechanism, once you have life, won't spontaneously improve it. So those, those things are now, uh, to me, beyond... Um, th there's no conflict in my mind. That it's clear that, that those things are true. Uh, geology is very... Uh, difficult still. Uh, the data is, conf in my opinion, conflicted. And, and, and the origin of man, I think, is by God's grace coming into clearer focus that we are, you know, we started with Adam and Eve not so long ago. But, um, but I struggled with the data and I struggled with authority because how, who am I to challenge all the Nobel laureates, the National Academy of Science, the uh, American Association for the uh, for the advancement of science. I'm just a little person, and those are big institutions, and they carry a lot of weight. 
And so I totally empathize why a theistic evolutionist would go, hey, that's, this is crazy. We can't stand against that type of authority. Um, and, and, uh, and also, when I was a theistic evolutionist, I had not explored the evidence the other side. I, I was totally oblivious. Why well, look at the other side? It's obvious that the author human authority is right on this. And so I empathize with uh, those people who are, who, who are struggling with it. Uh, I guess I would make a few points. One is I just strongly urge them to examine the evidence. Like, like if you're, if you're uh, teaching, uh, let's say, the, uh, the Big Bang Theory in class, critically examine it and have your students critically examine it to see its strengths and its weaknesses. I think that it uh, doesn't actually withstand scrutiny. And so, uh, but if until you actually... You know, there's a, pas a, a proverb that says uh, an argument seems good until you hear the other side. So uh, it's really important that uh, all people be aware of both sides. I think if you're a creationist, you should know evolutionary point of view. If you're an evolutionist, you have, a, to be honest, to be intellectually honest, you can't reject it until you've examined what creationists believe. So uh, that's one exhortation is examine the, uh, the other side the exer second exhortation would be, um, in the end, this is a spiritual issue. It has huge spiritual implications. In the end, we make a faith choice. Who are we loyal to? Is it the world or is it God? And so in the end, I, I believe this is a very important spiritual choice. So for the theistic evolutionists who may here be here, I lovingly exhort you to uh, Choose Jesus above all else, above your career, above your academic standing. And um, so, um, I have a third point, but I have to remember what it was. <laughs> I've learned there's always three points. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, I've lost it. So, you'll have to stay tuned for point number three. <laughs> <laughs> um. Would it be fair to summarize what you've said is, uh, as the genome is attempting to swim against the tide and natural selection just isn't fast enough to pull you forward? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really good analogy. You know, when you're talking about technical stuff and you're trying to communicate it to a, a general audience, you need mental pictures. Here's the mental picture I have. Okay, you're a man in a boat, a little rowboat, and uh, that you forgot to seal the cracks. It's just, it's leaking. Every plank in the board is leaking. And so the water's just coming up through every possible hole. So there's no way to plug the holes. And you have a, a bucket. You're going to bail to keep yourself afloat because the water's coming in. You need to bail out the water, right? But your bucket's about this big, so it's like a thimble. And the water's pouring in. Mutation rate is eno enormous. Just, you know, I every generation, there are, even in a small town, there are millions of new mutations pouring in. Well, you can only select away so many people in that town, and, you, and the people who are left still are more mutant than their parents. If we selected, let's suppose these people are more inferior, these people are inferior, and you guys are superior, and let's suppose we select away 50% of the population, which is draconian selection, guess what? Everybody on this side of the room who survives is still got 100 more mutations than their parents. And so selection cannot keep up with it. It's, it can't even begin to keep up with it. And that's all of our simulations show. Uh, we can only select away about 5% of all the bad mutations. The rest just accumulate in a straight line. So it's really striking. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. I, when, you're, when you're talking about the problem, it sounds to me like it's a theological problem. The problem is the fall. And the evidence that you're giving is scientific evidence, so it's a theological problem with scientific evidence showing that that's the case. Mm -hmm. And my question is this, with the solution, which has been uh, altogether theological, meaning salvation and the will of God, do you anticipate a corresponding scientific understanding? In terms of uh, redemption? Yes. Do you, do you anticipate, given that God is a God of law and, and natural law, do you anticipate that when the will of God 
does get enacted and when salvation does get accomplished that there'll be a scientific understanding about how uh, uh, related to that. Okay, so um, I, that's not my point of view, but um, basically, um, the, you know, since, since the beginning, since Christ, since before Christ, um, people understood that, um, that there's a creation and that it's been corrupted. And uh, without any science, they were called to believe that. Christ and the apostles said, believe this, it's true, it's consistent with scripture from the beginning, and it's actually uh, spiritually, intuitively clear that we live in a beautiful world that has been somehow broken. And so uh, what role does science have to do with this? Why aren't we just people of faith like, peop like Christians have always been people of faith? It's because uh, many people, there's, there's been a barrier put bef in front of lots of believers or would-be believers that says science won't let you believe scripture. And so now that science has triumphed in some way, uh, we can no longer just be people of faith. And so what I'm, wh what I'm doing and what the other scientists uh, at Loma Linda University are doing who are trying to affirm scripture and, and do research that's uh, relevant to these issues is we're saying, no, the science is consistent with scripture. The attacks on scripture like Darwinian theory are incorrect and therefore the barrier to faith goes away and people can choose Christ again by faith. In the end, it's all faith. Do you want God or not? Do you want to believe what Jesus taught or not? But the t technical issues have been set before us that have, been, that have made people stumble. And so if we can remove the, the, the deceptions and, uh, and false understandings, many more people will feel free to come to a faith decision. But, but for me, the, um, I'm not, actually, Bernard and I had a really interesting conversation. We both acknowledge that we scientists, even Christian scientists, tend to be materialists. You know, we, materialist thinking creeps into the way we see things. But, uh, but I declare to you that I am a supernaturalist <laughs> and, that I am, uh, and that the natural is, sent, uh, is built upon a supernatural foundation. Mm -hmm. And so the, we, the, the world and all this stuff and atoms and matter and us are products of, uh, were sprang miraculously out of a supernatural, uh, out, out of the spiritual realm. And that for, for me, my hope, my redemption is, uh, to, to, is transcendent of material and natural law. God made natural law, but he's not bound by it. So I don't think it will be a naturalistic uh, redemption. I think it will be a spiritual redemption. And so. may, may I ask a question? Yes. I... Um, the question is... Oh, I heard your voice. It's a, it's a friendly question. Uh, during the 20th century, there has been a remarkable increase in the average lifespan, several decades, uh, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing world. How do you connect your research with that reality? Right. So uh, that's an easy one. Um, <laughs> Take away the doctors and the pills and the vaccines and the antibiotics and take off your glasses, your hearing aid, and your artificial uh, implements in your body and you'll find that your life expectancy is uh, more like 40 than 70 to 80. So, so this, the recent uh, surge in life expectancy is, is due to uh, technological innovation and, um, and to basically adequate nutrition more than anything else. Uh, that's not, doesn't have anything to do with genetics. We're still degenerating at the same pace. And, s and there's no, nothing on the horizon that's going to stop mutation. It would be, if I, if any of you have an a pill that would stop mutation, I guarantee you, you will get very rich. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, uh, I want to follow up on the, the kind of the comment the young lady made. Um, yeah, in terms of um, the form of the discussion, you're describing here again scientific evidence, and but the real issue is more one of a philosophical basis for the interpretation of that scientific evidence. Aren't we? Shouldn't we be 
using this to demonstrate that the philosophy of naturalism and materialism is the is the problem and that you know evolution is just a description of change over time everybody has you know we both christians and the uh, atheists have a model for change over time in terms of the uh, biological systems and so the real issue uh, seems to be, to me to be that we need to recognize that this is is eroding the basis for assuming that you know the, the philosophical basis for science of naturalism and materialism is 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 wrong yeah i i agree um the evolutionists and the creationists agree about change over time but the, but there's this really distinctive thing it's down not up and so that's um like a radical difference um and so it's not like one side they can't both be right it's either down or up or it's right in the middle and no one thinks that things are not changing so um but but i i do agree that materialism is the you know darwin was a materialist and his predecessors were materialists so their determination to deny the supernatural is i think has driven the enlightenment uh, wh which we're still in the enlightenment is we're in the living in the enlightenment era and um but uh, th what's striking about this particular data is it points to um, a beginning, uh, and you can only imagine a beginning uh, where, where people are perfect. If you take away all our mutations, we'd be perfect. Uh, and so it really clearly points to a supernatural beginning. That's why I, I, um, I would encourage those of you who have you know, been kind of, you know, who believe scripture but have been kind of taken captive by materialist ways of thought, look in the mirror and say to yourself every morning 10 times, I'm a supernaturalist. I'm a supernaturalist. <laughs> I'm a supernaturalist. Because all Christians in the end are supernaturalists. We believe that God was there before there was any matter. We believe that, he's, that, that his spirit sustains matter. And we believe that he's going to destroy all matter and make a new heaven and earth. So Big time, we are supernaturalists. Our hope in heaven derives from our supernaturalist perspective. Supernaturalism does not negate naturalism. I am totally into modern medicine and computers and cars, and I believe that I am made of matter. Actually, I believe my body is made out of matter. I am not my body. But um, so, so you can be, a supernaturalist is also a naturalist. I don't know anybody who doesn't believe that if you jump off a cliff, you won't fall. So. Um, but there are many people who deny the supernatural and they're missing so much. They're missing actually everything that matters is non-material. Just reflect on it. You realize that there's everything that is really important is a non-material entity. Yes. Where are we in denting the armor of science in this? So I think that uh, science is best served when it's liberated from dogma and from... Uh, when it's liberated from um, political correctness. And so what, what we're doing, some people would say, is a threat to science. Oh, you're a threat to science because you used research to challenge a paradigm I, uh, and to better understand how the human genome changes. I, I think that's the nature of true science is to discover what is true. I don't think we're denting science. I think this science has been actually held back let me just give you no, i i mean where are we in spreading this information to to reluctant scientists oh um but continue with what you were saying okay well, <laughs> um <laughs> reluctant scientists is a very mild way to say it there are people who would uh, <laughs> die before they would even sit through this lecture let alone um embrace it so yeah there's like it's spiritual warfare. I best, the best way to understand it, in my opinion, again, because I'm a super, I've become a supernaturalist, is um, that we are in the midst of a spiritual war, and uh, the opposition we're seeing is totally irrational, totally inconsistent. If we're wrong, okay. Everybody's wrong about something, and the world's full of people who are wrong. Why do people go ballistic when they hear what we believe? It's because there are spiritual issues involved. What I see is... Uh, People who are totally committed to academic freedom are willing to shut us down in the university. People who are totally committed to diversity uh, are willing to you know, say, this group has to be eliminated. And people who are totally into tolerance are saying, what, we are not going to let your point of view be heard. And so there's something strange going on. Yeah. 
So, yes. Just um, to look at the biological decay curve again, it seems like the curve is flatlining, um, and with the uh, with the leaky rowboat scenario, you'd think that curve would be going down a lot faster. How long does the human species have? <laughs> okay. Everybody asks me that. I, 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 um, we don't know, but it is flat. It does not flatline, but it, it uh, it's approaching a limit. So as you approach, you, you can't go below zero. So so it has to approach a limit, and it's approaching a limit of zero fitness. But uh, but uh, actually, evolutionary biologists have have studied species that are approaching extinction, and uh, and what happens is, you know, anything that's still alive today has to have leveled off, otherwise it'd be gone. So there has to be a leveling off. Uh, selection gets a little more efficient as you approach extinction because certain individuals are are dead, and they they're not. And so they can't, they have zero probability, the, the least fit have zero probability of success. But um, then what happens is, as fitness declines, you know, as fitness declines, fertility declines. And then what happens is your uh, selection, as your p surplus population is smaller, uh, it causes what's called mutational meltdown. So basically it flatlines and then collapses at some point. And so the collapse is, uh, there's no way to know when the final collapse would happen. But it, it doesn't just taper right down to nearly zero and then finally you know, never get there. What happens is it approaches a point and then collapses. Just like the same thing happens in our bodies. Once, uh, once we reach a certain age, our repair enzymes start to mutate and become defective, and then, and then we reach our, a terminal age. That's why 100, uh, there's, no, there's no infinite extension past. You, know, you might think of it as a bell-shaped curve that goes way out, but there's a limit for our lifespan. It basically has to do with how many mutations we can tolerate before the system collapses. <laughs> it's unthinkable that we need to shut down this discussion. <laughs> but our hour is gone, and uh, many of you wish to attend the worship service that follows. So I think we should thank Dr. Sanford for being here and sharing his heart with us. <clears throat> Just to reinforce what he was just saying, when I asked him this question, let me repeat what he told me uh, about how long we have. He said, don't make any plans after 2096. <laughs> <laughs> Let us not only thank him, but the good Lord. Father in heaven, creator of the universe, and our redeemer, we thank you for what we have heard today it has encouraged us, it has informed us, and Lord, we put our faith and trust in you. Thank you for Dr. Sanford's ministry here today and elsewhere. Let us all be faithful and to the best of the wisdom you give to defend your honor and your status as the source of all things and the ultimate Savior of the human race. Bless us today, dear Lord, as we commit ourselves again to you. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Kind of sticking around. Uh, but he feels, and I understand his sentiment, that he perhaps is more useful here. So it's up to you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I'm actually, uh, I came a long ways to encourage you all, and so I'm really delighted that you're interested, and so I'm uh, happy to make myself available. Um, the the que first question I'd like to uh, address is from Paul Geem, and his question was, uh, the population bomb didn't quite bomb as fast as people were afraid. People uh, my age know that uh, in the 70s and 80s, people were, you know, really felt that we were on the verge of, an ex of really explosive population growth that was going to lead to just devastating uh, famine. And um, it, it didn't, it, it slowed down significantly. We still have uh, 
growing population, but it certainly didn't grow like people were projecting. And he asked, could this be due to genetic entropy, that it didn't explode like we thought because of that? And um, I would say that it was definitely due to a reduced fertility. Uh, some of the fertility was um, due to birth control, uh, but there all, is also uh, clear evidence of reduced fertility in men, very like a 50% reduction in sperm count in, uh, in men. And everybody's very, con you know, biologists are very concerned about that. That's a pretty radical, that's approaching infertility. I mean, uh, and so um, there is a lot of uh, concern about that. Most people assume it's some type of unknown environmental factor. It might be due to cell phones uh, uh, or sitting next to a computer too long, but um, uh, I don't know. But it's certainly, when you do have the accumulating mutations, one thing you expect is reduced fertility. So that is a concern, because when that starts to happen, then you are in a, a kind of a dangerous place in terms of extinction. But if you look around, we're not in much danger of extinction at this moment in time. So. That's my answer for, for Paul. Um, yes, sir. Um, I, have a, I attended your uh, seminar Thursday. That was wonderful. And it's, I'm just saying that as a compliment. Yeah. But um, just an aside, as scientists, we spend most of our time and energy doing reverse engineering. Nobody's setting about to improve creation. We're just looking to see what it is. But I have a question. Our model for creation, it seems like, is that it was a cookie cutter, one time event. It happened in a point in time, and then everything, as you say, is running downhill. However, when you look at the geological column, it looks like there's simpler life forms where certain enzyme systems, certain hemostasis factors didn't exist. And there's actually, it appears to be, I'm not saying this as a counter argument to your mm -hmm. main thesis, but there appears to be a progression of um, biology, you know, new enzymes, new systems, new, uh, new things appear, and they have a timeline associated with them. Mm -hmm. um, what is your model of creation? Is it uh, ongoing? Is this planet like a giant Petri dish where they say, okay, let's try out this new protein mm -hmm. kinase, this new inflammasome, this new thing, and then uh, the experiment is ongoing. Is that, uh, does that beg for a different model of creation? Yeah, so, so um, I've come to a place where I've, I've actually surrendered to Scripture, and Scripture doesn't actually make it crystal clear how God did it, but uh, if we look at Exodus 20, it says, in six, we, we, we honor the Sabbath because in six days God made the heavens, the earth, the seas and all that is in them, which is pretty inclusive. So, um, so I, I, I suspect the geological column is a, you know, it's a, ambiguous how to interpret the geological column. I think most people struggle with that who look at it carefully. Um, but uh, my feeling is that the geological column reflects sequential burial, not sequential origin. That's my own view on that. Yes, sir. So in your book, I don't recall that you addressed the, the idea of uh, detection and repair mechanisms in the genome. And I just wanted to hear you respond to where that fits into the uh, mutations and so forth. Yeah, um, I've, had, I've had people tell me, uh, well, you must be wrong because you haven't heard of repair enzymes. Um, and there are repair enzymes, thank God. Uh, we would. The mutation rate is so high in man that we would die of old age in a few weeks, except that 99.999% of all mutations are repaired uh, by these amazing repair systems that are just like, blow your mind, that, that molecules can find the mistakes and fix them. The problem with the repair enzyme system, of course, is that um, it's like once the pain is dry, you can't fix it. So you can only repair the uh, mutations while they're fresh, and so to speak. And so uh, the mutations that we observe and that we count, the mutation counts, the 100 mutations per generation that I've mentioned, is after repair. So if it wasn't for repair, uh, we would be long gone. Yes. 
Um, you talk about the the decline of species, human species, and uh, we assume other animal species as well, mm -hmm. um, that they're moving towards extinction. What's your perspective on, on efforts for conservation of either species or ecosystems? Um, how does that play into, into this issue of decline, no matter really what we are going to do? Right. So um, I guess I'm, um, I, I believe in conservation. Um, like, for example, whales are awesome creatures. Praise God for whales. Why would we let them disappear? Um, uh, snail darters, on the other hand, uh, which are just like a subdivision of other minnows, um, probably no great loss. People have to learn to, the, the typical uh, population has no discernment between what would be a true serious loss from the, eco, from the world ecosystem versus a, a trivial change in, in uh, some small variant within a, a group. And of course, there's some things that I would like to see go extinct, like the influenza virus. So. Um, we don't need to conserve that one. Uh, so I'd say that we need, we need conservation. It's certainly not going to, it can, what, what, all the things we can do, like let's say good health, uh, it, we, it slows down the process. We buy time. You know, I know Seventh-day Adventists are awesome and you take, uh, you know, you respect your bodies and, and are very responsible and you live something like 10 years more than everybody else, which is awesome. But of course, you're only buying time because you're still going to die. Um, and I think that, that the species that are going out are, uh, except where humans are being reckless, like the, the way we hunted buffalo or the way we hunted whales, apart from that, I think uh, things are playing out in a way that we can't necessarily control. And um, I think our focus should be on man, because man is in a huge crisis. We're not endangered in a sense, but we are, on a, uh, we are really under duress as a, as a population. So I would focus more emotional energy on preserving uh, civilization than preserving uh, some exotic uh, species of minnow. So that's my, my read on it. Yeah, yes. Um, just as a follow-up to the previous question, to put things in perspective, every one of our cells sustains on a daily basis over 20,000 DNA lesions just from endogenous wear and tear from normal operations. All exogenous causes come in addition to that. So if it weren't for the normal repair mechanisms of which even the humblest bacterium has more than 200 different sort, that means we would not survive very long at all. I, I've been wondering about those numbers, so I really appreciate you giving me that. 20,000 per cell per day. Uh, that's a lot of damage, and praise God for these, this elaborate DNA repair system that is in every cell. It's really uh, awesome. Yes? I wondered if you could um, say a little bit about how Cornell has responded to your work and your conclusions. Uh, they, they have ignored it. I'm, it's like I don't exist. Yeah. So I actually would really like dialogue, uh, but I cannot. The people won't talk to me, basically. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you you pointed out that we must have started perfect, and we've been going downhill. When uh, just an, an idea, okay? What at the second coming, when when God does what He does to us, and we're back again? Would you? say that at least part of that is he's fixing all those mutations. <laughs> I, I, I guess um, I, I hope for more than a repair. I hope for a totally new body. He could make, and I'm hoping that he makes me even better than I was born, <laughs> when I was born, because I was already pretty mutant. Um, so so I, I, I'm envisioning a, a totally new model. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, people may not recognize me, but um, I think God will work that out, <laughs> so. Um, maybe one more, yes. I really appreciate the time and the energy that you and your wife have uh, devoted to Loma Linda these last few days. It really has brought a lot of encouragement, inspiration to us. Mm. As you talk about 
Cornell kind of is ignoring you. Do you have some generic advice on how best for creationists uh, to make their, their case uh, nationally? Uh, are there certain attitudes or approaches that would uh, be better than others? So, um, yes. I, I, when, when, when they first ignored me, I was so relieved because <laughs> I expected to be strongly attacked. Uh, now I would like some dialogue, so I don't like being invisible anymore. Um, because I think we, I, th that uh, any open-minded person now should be willing to reconsider Darwin. It's just the evidence is so strong. And that I, I think that um, so we don't have to be belligerent or pushy or rude or anything. We just have to say what we've learned, and it's really compelling, which is, I think, why they choose to ignore it. This is a dialogue that they can't, uh, will not benefit them. Um, so I would say um, that we can argue four points. Uh, I believe that the atheistic worldview is built upon spontaneous universe, spontaneous life, spontaneous ascent of life, which is my area of research, and spontaneous man. And I would say, all four, if any one of those four is collapses, atheism collapses. They need all four pillars for it to stand up. And I contend that none of those four pillars is, is uh, def intellectually defensible. They are, they're all coming down, and uh, any honest dialogue will expose the, uh, the, the the deception that these are absolutely true. They're not even credible. They're not, and so we don't, so there's two sides. There's an offense and a defense. Usually we're defending our position. Uh, actually, they have an indefensible position on, in all four areas. And so I feel that we can politely but deliberately press into those issues because I think it's a no-lose, uh, especially the middle two. It's already a done deal. They acknowledge they can't imagine how life could have started spontaneously. And now this, this issue, the you know, spontaneous ascent of life, is incredibly strong. And so they really have to go to really far-fetched scenarios and imaginings to justify how life could just keep getting better and better due to selection. So, so we, have a, we can push back a little bit and say, the paradigms that, ruin the, that reign in the university are indefensible and need to be re-examined. And uh, if, if and I don't see how any university can uh, stand against that reasoning. There should be no sacred cows. And, uh, and though, if you take away the four paradigms, or any one of them, it leaves a big hole. And then you go, well, let's see. We need to, we need to examine some new models and some new, um, some, some new uh, possible explanations for these things. And of course, that opens up the the logical idea of either there's some type of natural process that hasn't been discovered yet that's doing it, or there's a designer and maybe scripture is true. And then you can start to look at defending scripture. So, uh, you know, looking for evidence for a flood, looking for evidence of uh, that man descended from a single man and a single woman. There's actually strong evidence for that. And so now that's no longer uh, being offensive. We're defending or upholding our position. So, I, but I think it's much easier to challenge the other side than to defend ours. We, at this point, I would more proclaim our position and challenge uh, what is uh, indefensible in terms of what's being taught in the textbooks. Hmm. Yes. Well, two things. Uh, to proclaim, would that require other scientists to publish works such as yourself so that there's not one lone book? I mean, are other people doing this to get the word out? So the textbooks at least right. offer both sides. And then also, in the high schools or in, in the education, if you talk to any teacher who's been in for 30-some years, at what level are we, are we about flatlining? Because there's a real, the children are becoming unable to think in greater quantities. The special ed departments have grown to almost the largest departments in the whole school. Part of this is diagnosis, 
but we have just a host of childhood in our children uh, situations that didn't seem to be in the past, and this is only in a short time, but, and so you're speaking long, but, um, and we can't go out and say, you know, this is what's happening, but there seems to be something happening in the children. I, I strongly agree. It's very, something's wrong, really wrong. Uh, the same thing is most people don't realize that Alzheimer's is a, an epidemic and that Alzheimer's basically didn't exist a few decades ago. Uh, pe people are like, oh, it's just the way it is when people get old. There's, there's no biblical or literary or historical evidence that this is what happens normally. It's a new phenomenon. And uh, so there's some, some things, really scary things happening, including with, with the kids and with people who are older. And um, the amount of autoimmune disease and allergies and everything seems there's something wrong. Um, I'm not ready to say that we're undergoing mutational meltdown, but I am very disturbed by the things, the type of things you're mentioning. Um, again, whatever is causing it, I say, come soon, Jesus. Yes. Oh, don't you feel that there are, a f you know, a fair number of scientists like yourself who are uh, creationists and believe in God? They're just silent out of fear. There's a huge amount of fear, and there's a huge amount of people under, uh, in the closet. Huge number of people, and uh, and and there are a huge number of people who would believe. You know, I, I, here's kind of the sense I get: is I have people who say. Please don't convince me, because I think you could, and it, that could cause me a lot of trouble. So they're actually saying, I'm going to take a position I can defend within academia. And so they're actually modifying what they believe to make it a little easier to, to survive academia. That tells you uh, about, number one, what, how academia is actually oppressive often. And number two, it speaks of the spiritual war, because sometimes our fear is unreasonable. Um, and so one of the things I've uh, several times spoken to the, my uh, Loma Linda audience is, let's pray against the spirit of fear, because it's a key element of why we tend to keep retreating and caving in and retreating and caving in. Our position is much stronger than most of us realize. And so this all-out retreat is without, it's totally irrational. Our position has gotten enormously stronger in the last 10 years, and yet all the, Pretty much across the board, I see more retreat, more and more retreat. And I can't not understand it, except that there's a spirit of fear. I just, uh, yes, sir. Okay, there was a discussion uh, not too many weeks ago uh, referring to creation of superhuman beings, uh, uh, you know, genetic mutation, well, genetically altered human uh, genes to make superhumans. What, what do you think, uh, being that the uh, survival uh, instinct it would, would probably kick in at some point, what do you think the likelihood of something like that actually occurring? And yeah. So it's, it will be a real temptation for evolutionists because their whole hope is that we're gonna get better. But, but here's the thing, picture a car and it's uh, 10 years old, and it's got a lot of rust and a lot of dings and a lot of scratches. And, uh, and you want to put on a new, brand new hood ornament. Okay, so you say, wow, we're making it better. But you see, that hood ornament, which might be a new gene in man, doesn't negate all the ding scratches and rust. It doesn't reverse all the entropy. It's just a, it's like a new coat of paint. It doesn't really, it covers up the rust. It doesn't stop the rust. So, um, but I, I think it's coming, and I think it's very disturbing because inherently it will be experimental. And so you're using human beings as experimental objects. And, um, you know, there's, there's, I, I don't doubt that they're going to try to do it. Um, it's, in fact, if you ask yourself why, why are they pushing so hard for the embryonic stem research, it's because it's exactly the same technology you'd use for doing human genetic engineering. And so that's, that's really the underlying motive, in my opinion. And it's, I don't want, I hope, pray we don't go there. 
it won't solve the problem. It's like the hood ornament. It will not stop the decay of the car. The, the only other point was that just to caution people that they, they may, from this lecture, being that you're not uh, particularly uh, a medical doctor or this type of thing, to uh, assume that many diseases and things are genetically based because uh, that's, that's uh, and then so, in other words, it's not really going to make a big difference if you take care of your health and this kind of thing. Now, most people know this in this area, but some are maybe, maybe wavering or don't know that. Mm -hmm. So uh, with Alzheimer's and other things, there's a lot of factors, chemicals, and, mm -hmm. uh, and there's, in medicine itself, there's, uh, it's, it's, there's many false science going on there too. So right. that for the same reason, it's the emperor has no clothes kind of sy syndrome and mm -hmm. nobody wants to get in trouble by you know, rocking the boat, so. Yeah, the, the emperor has no clothes. Only, you can only defeat it when someone has the courage enough to say it. And uh, I do think that people are starting to say it. And uh, we can pray that, that some of this will come down. Uh, some of this, some of the deception might, um, at least some people's eyes might be opened. Uh, one thing I'd like to, I'd like to come back to the, the person who asked kind of strategy, how do we, how do, we do this more effectively? Um, and it, it relates to something the pastor told me. Um, it's really important we have a firewall between uh, the things we hold by faith and the things that we understand by science. Like, um, like we believe that Christ was resurrected from the dead, and we don't have proof of it. You can use logical, well, you know, it seems reasonable because this, this, and this. But in the end, we don't, we don't have a video or <laughs> documentation. Uh, we believe it by faith, and so there's nothing wrong with saying, I believe it by faith. Um, I, I, for example, cannot uh, give an answer for all the geology uh, issues. I, I'm a biologist, and, and so I will, sometimes people will say, well, how old is the earth? And I go, I'm not sure. I'm not a geologist, I'm not qualified to stand against all, but by faith, I do believe that scripture is true and that, uh, and that the earth is young. But I said, I confess, I don't know, because we're supposed to be humble, because we all have limited understanding. So we said that's by faith. But if you ask me, what do I think about genetic entropy? I can say, I've studied this for 10 years. I know about it. And I can say with authority that, there, that it's totally irrational to believe that, that genomes are getting better through mutation selection process. And so I, I make a very clear distinction when I talk to people. These things I believe by faith. These things I believe by evidence. And, but then I, and so, but when they say, well, I believe only by evidence, <laughs> of course we can, we realize that, oh, really, you believe by evidence that life arose spontaneously. No, you believe it by faith. If you believe that uh, life spontaneously gets better over time, can you defend that? And they can't. So it becomes very clear that they are believing things by faith also. So then the whole dialogue changes when we say, okay, let's talk about faith or let's talk about evidences. But let, and let's not confuse them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I was wondering if any um, research is being done on how the um, effects of microwave cell phones and computers mm -hmm. and, all, and plus the neurotoxins and the chemicals and the food and the medications, how that's affecting the mutations. Um, well, I say that all that probably doesn't help too much, um, but, <laughs> I, but I'm not qualified to be able to address them. Um, Dr. Brand. Yeah, uh, somebody raised concern that you're the, a lone voice, uh, and I'd just like to make one comment on that. Fortunately, Dr. Um, Sanford is getting support from some interesting places. Uh, just mention one. Uh, there's a, a, I read a book by a very eminent evolutionist, molecular biologist, who from from new understanding of the cell in the case that there is no possibility that that random mutation and selection could be uh, of any value in the cell of course he's he says oh well i know that life all evolved you know it makes to make sure everybody knows that he's believes in evolution but yet the evidence doesn't is not consistent with it do you see this phenomenon in others too they they got evidence that it makes that doesn't fit darwinism and yet they will insist that darwin must be right Yes, so, so uh, this person I cited, uh, Michael Lynch, 
he and I apparently think exactly the same. Uh, he, everything I believe, he believes, uh, but he says, but still somehow it must have evolved. And so he, he would shun any creationist, especially me. And yet uh, all of his papers affirm everything I've been saying. And that's, so I'm, I'm waiting for some, a few people in the population genetics community to actually, with, you know, to show some scientific integrity and get up and say, you know, these are real issues and we have real problems with our theory. And let's be honest, uh, I'm just waiting for some, uh, a few, one or a few people. They don't have to be Christians. They have to just have to have enough integrity to say, you know, this is a real problem. Yes. I got a couple questions. Um, it seems as though, um, from, from what you said, that you uh, do keep the Sabbath, but you're not Seventh-day Adventist. Could you explain how you got to where you are uh, religiously? So um, I am. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I sure, I sure am uh, increasing in my respect for Seventh-day Adventists as I, the more I interact with them. So this trip has been really uh, my view of Seventh-day Adventism, and Seventh-day Adventists has, um, you know, just really, I've just really uh, been affirmed that you're brethren and that you uh, have a lot of, are doing a lot of things right. And, um, you know, traditionally, my Sabbath has been on, on Sunday, but uh, the Lord's Day. But um, I am very comfortable. S I, I don't see that as a problem. I'd be happy to uh, worship God on Saturday instead of Sunday. It wouldn't make uh, any bit of difference in my understanding. Uh, un un very unrelated question. Um, it would seem to me as though um, for those uh, species that have a short generation time, you know, weeks to, to months, uh, would have gone through a much larger number of generations uh, than humans. And mm -hmm. so uh, perhaps could have gotten to the point of, of collapse. Uh, is this something that, um, I mean, we could observe and, and could we, do we gain evidence that this is the direction that things are, are headed by observing certain populations? That so, so that's a really good point. Um, the, number one, uh, fast cycling organisms don't necessarily have more mutations per year because although they have, they have small genomes, so their mutation rate per generation is much less. So in a year, you may or may not have more mutations. Um, and um, you want to follow up on that, or? I, it's from medical school. It seems that I recall in a cellular molecular biology class that it's most of the mutations occur with replication, not uh, when they're in a static uh, state mm -hmm. between replication. Is that correct? Uh, most of them are replication associated. But um, basically, if you have a genome, let's say, of li like the influenza virus has a genome of 10,000, we have a genome of three billion. So uh, we have, just by, by the size of the genome, we uh, have a higher, more mistakes because we have more things to replicate. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is uh, faster cycling. If, if you could, um, let's say you could have fast cycling people versus not. So some people are gonna have children at 15 and that culture has decided we're always gonna have children at fifth, you know, very early. And another culture that says you have to wait till 40 before you have children. Um, and the question is, which one will go extinct first? It's the fast cycling one because they get more cycles of selection. You can only do selection during the replication, during the reproductive phase. And so, uh, like mice get to cycle through selection several times a year. Their mutation rate is uh, about, is less than ours, but not by too much because the genome size is about the same. But so in the same amount of time over, let's say, a 100 year period, there'd be two or three generations for man, just two or three cycles of selection. In mice, there would be hundreds of cycles of selection. And the, the mice actually should go extinct after man, not before man. It's the long-lived mammals that should go extinct first. Uh, so mice, let's say, don't prove, disprove our thesis. Bacteria are a whole different thing because bacteria can go dormant. So if all the bacteria in the Act, all of the biologically active bacteria in the world died today. Tomorrow they would be coming out of dormant spores or freezers and other things. And they, so there's continuous re-inoculation in at the microbial level. 
So those issues, I've heard people say that proves genetic entropy is wrong. They haven't thought it through carefully enough. Yes. I was just wondering, what is the major reason why evolutionists are afraid of creation? <laughs> I, that would make me feel really good. Uh, the, the evolutionists I encounter, you tend to be extremely arrogant. But actually, there is some fear, too. I think they're, f I, I can't explain it. Um, because I, overall, I think they feel, because they, can have, they hold the microphone and they're in power, they feel incredibly empowered. And so they come across as amazingly arrogant. But, but I, several people, this trip, have. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists have expressed that perception. And I think it's because you folks are stronger in your faith and your conviction and you know what you're talking about and you're intimidating to them because they're used to thinking of creationists as poorly informed and, uh, and um, not capable of refuting them. What do you think? Okay, good. Do you, do you think it's a matter of accountability that if they admit to the fact that there is a creator and God, then they become accountable to him? And they don't want to be accountable to anyone. That's certainly true for some of them. I think it's complex what brings them to that place. Once they've taken a position, they're, they're a slave to their ego and their vanity. So it's very hard for grown academics to change their mind. In the back. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm not clear on everything that you've covered, uh, but I'd like to reemphasize uh, aspects of diet uh, relative to, uh, for instance, Parkinson's disease. Uh, we have been treating Parkinson's disease over 10 or 11 years on a sparse basis, but we find that diet a vegan diet without any animal protein, particularly without casein from milk, will allow the symptoms of Parkinson's disease to all disappear in a matter of months. And we're talking uh, a case of uh, 10 or 11 patients only, lack of funding and other problems, but uh, Diet is a tremendous uh, effector of life and death and a lot of other aspects of mental characterization with a change in diet. Mm. I, I appreciate that. I, I think that uh, that's probably one of the factors that, that's causing some of the problems we're seeing is poor diet. Um, I think we're almost done, but let's have just a few more questions. Um, uh, go ahead. You spoke of a firewall. You know, God says, let us reason together. And I'm so glad he reasoned with your mind. Mm -hmm. Then, when you have discovered that one area of the Bible is true through your expertise and your area that, that you're concentrating in, doesn't it make the other part of the firewall and faith that much stronger? Even though you don't know completely about the geological column, you have an indication that experts, if they would reason with God in that area, might find that true. So it seems to be a bolstering of faith uh, by reasoning with God and finding out one area that of the Bible is true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think we've all experienced that, where God has affirmed something that was troubling us. And when he resolves that, uh, then the other areas where we don't know or don't understand something, we still have a real sense of peace that uh, God's got it under control, even if we don't understand it all. So I do believe that's true. Yes. So um, are we, are we uh, Bernard, you're looking like you're ready to... Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good sign. I can read that. Um, okay, so God bless you all.
We want to we want to thank Dr. Sanford for coming. Thank you again. Once, let me just shake your hand on behalf of everybody. We certainly appreciate your input and 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 come back someday. Don't just make one visit here. <laughs> We'd love to see more of, learn more, uh, read your book, etc. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who attend my classes here regularly, I need to warn you that I will be gone the next two Sabbaths. I will not be here the next two weeks. So um, if you want to hang on for a moment, I'll, I'll sort of tell you what the plans are for the class, but the rest of you are free to go or to come and talk to Dr. Sanford privately. <laughs>